This video on Compute Shaders is based on recipes in our newly updated ebook, The Universal Render Pipeline Cookbook, Recipes for Shaders and Visual Effects. In the ebook, at the link below, you'll find 12 recipes giving concrete examples of various techniques useful to most developers. There's all the ingredients you need to create an X-ray-like image effect with stencils, build a tune and outline shader with Shader Graph, use procedural noise to create wood, use Photoshop and a LUT image to add color grading to your scenes, and produce reflections and refraction, and much more. All right, let's get started with Compute Shaders. Before we begin, a little disclaimer, this is an advanced topic. For this particular series, it might be best for you to start with the book chapter, go at your own pace, and then come to the video walkthrough to go through things again and solidify the concepts. Okay, compute shaders. The term shader can be a little misleading. A compute shader can be used for any computationally intensive task that involves the same calculations being applied to multiple entities. Our example in this video is particle effects, and in the next video, flocking. Unity, of course, supports a flexible particle system, but in this video, we're going to develop our own. That way we can understand the techniques necessary to create shaders that work with instance meshes, which allow us to create visual effects featuring tens of thousands of meshes. A million low polygon meshes are totally feasible depending on your GPU. These techniques can be used to create grass, hair, water, armies, and crowds. If you plan to work along, which we recommend, then download the resources at the link in the description. Our focus in this video is a project called Particle Fun. To open it, go to Scenes, Compute Shaders, Particles, and Particle Fun. And then over in your IDE, open ParticleFun.cs, ParticleFun.Compute, and ParticleFun.Shader from the same folder. ParticleFun.cs is a mono behavior that sets up the scene. ParticleFun.Compute is the compute shader, which handles updating a buffer that will contain each particle's position. And ParticleFun.Shader is the material shader used by the rendering pipeline to set the pixel color for each particle. When you run the program, you'll see that particles move towards the mouse position and change color over time. So let's review the code. We'll start with a C-sharp script. Here we define a particle. It has position, velocity, and life values. The data for an individual particle uses seven floats. So the size of a particle is seven times the size of a float. Then we declare a number of public variables that the user can adjust in the inspector. Material will be the particle material that uses the particle fun shader, and the shader will be particle fun.compute. More about those later. In the start method, we simply call init, the init method that initializes each particle. We start by creating a vector 3 with x, y, and z set to a random value between negative 1 and 1. Then we normalize this vector, that is, we set the vector to have the length of 1. Then we expand the length up to a length of 5 world units. Using this vector, we set the position of an individual particle in the particle array. Velocity is set to 0 and life to a random value between 1 and 6. A compute buffer is a block of data that will be resident on the GPU. Notice this has two parameters, the number of elements and the size of each element. Having created the buffer, we populate the buffer using the setData method. This transfers data from RAM to the GPU memory. This is necessary because compute shaders require that all data be in GPU memory. We call code in a compute shader using a special type of function in the compute shader code called a kernel. A kernel in this context is essentially a small program that can be executed simultaneously across thousands of GPU cores. Each kernel has a unique ID. We find its ID by calling the findKernel method using the function name as a parameter. Each kernel has three thread parameters, x, y, and z. The magic of compute shaders is the way they work in parallel. For the particle example, the thread group sizes are set as 256, 1, 1. This configuration works well across many GPU architectures. Without getting into details, you could optimize this from here if you know what you're targeting. From a C-sharp script, we can access the thread group sizes using the compute shader method get kernel thread group sizes. Kernels are called using the dispatch method. Like num threads, this also has values for the X group, the Y group, and the Z group. In order to understand thread IDs, suppose instead of 256, num threads is 4, so 411 and dispatch group sizes are 10 one In other words, 10 groups of four workers. 
Then IDX will have values in the range of 0 to 39, whereas IDY and IDZ will always be 0, because we're creating a one-dimensional array of threads. Using the same principle with our particle system, to make sure we have enough groups of 256 workers to handle all our particles, we need to dispatch the kernel for this number of times. For this example, all the work is in the X thread. Notice that the particle buffer is passed to the material as well as the compute shader. This is the principal trick of this example. We can use a shared compute buffer resident on the GPU across the compute shader and a vertex fragment shader. So we can manipulate the content of the buffer in the compute shader. And when we come to render the object using a vertex fragment shader, it makes use of the same buffer in the render. We need to initialize a render params instance. Here we simply set a large bounds instance. This will be needed when we use the graphics.render primitives to actually render the particles. Which now brings us to the update method. Here we set the delta time and mouse position for the compute shader, and more about those in a moment. Then we dispatch the kernel ID we found earlier. When we dispatch, we set the number of work groups for the x, y, and z dimensions. Since we want to run the kernel for particle count times and the x thread group size is 256, we precalculated group size x to be the integer ceiling of particle count over 256. Ceiling simply means if it was 7 over 2, the floating point value is 3.5. By taking the integer ceiling, we raise this to the next whole number, 4. Using group size x for the x dimension ensures the kernel will run with the x value having each index value from 0 to particle count and higher if particle count is not an exact multiple of 256. Once the dispatch has completed, the particle buffer will contain the new position values for each particle. Then we use a method of the graphics interface that needs some explanation. Render primitives takes four parameters. First, a render params instance that, at a minimum, defines a bounce area. The type of mesh topology, here we're rendering points, but we could be rendering lines of triangles. Then the vertex count in a single instance. For points, this will always be just one. And finally, the instance count. For this example, that is the number of particles. The actual rendering will be handled by the shader attached to the material. Let's look at that. In the particle fun shader file, we need to add a reference to the buffer, and this will need a definition of the particle struct. We set the buffer as a structured buffer, not a RW structured buffer, because the shader will not be writing to this buffer. Only the compute shader will do that. We have a point size property. Notice that the attribute struct, an instance of which is passed to the vert function, has an instance ID property. For a point shader, the instance ID will be set to 0 through to the particle count minus 1. We use this value as an index into the buffer. Since the compute shader is going to update this position value, we have a way of using the compute shader for positioning and the vertex fragment shader to do the rendering. When using mesh topology points, the shader must set the input parameter with the semantic P size to the pixel point size of a point. Here we set it to the variable point size, which is passed by the C-sharp script. Let's switch to the compute shader. We can create a compute shader by right-clicking the project window and using create, shader, compute shader. First, we need to define a buffer for our particles. It needs a struct that matches the one in the C-sharp script, and we need to declare a RW structured buffer. RW because this shader is going to write to the buffer. In the CS particle kernel, we have this code. We grab the particle whose index is id x from the buffer. Because of the way we will dispatch this kernel, this will have a value of 0 through to particle count minus 1. Then we decrement its life. We use the delta time property past each screen update to the compute shader by the C-sharp script. It's simply the time in seconds that has elapsed since the last update. We create a vector from the particle to the mouse position, setting the z value to 0. We haven't discussed the mouse position value yet, but it's set to the world position of the mouse. In the C-sharp script particle fun, we use an on GUI event. This detects a mouse press, and we use a bit of code to convert this into a screen position. If you want to know more about converting mouse positions to world coordinates, we have a useful link for that in the description. Now we have a vector we can use to accelerate the particle away from the mouse position. Then we use the particle's velocity modulated by delta time. 
Having updated the particle properties, we use these values to update the particle buffer. If a particle's life is less than zero, then we respawn the particle using a fast random function to generate the random values necessary. Extra-shift random number generators were a great discovery for real-time graphics by George Marsalia. And we have another link on that below if you want to learn more about this fast random numbers function. The particle is positioned within a sphere of radius 0.8, centered around the mouse position, and z is zero. We reset the life of a new particle to four seconds and reset the velocity to zero. We use the life property to control the color of the particle. Back in the vertex fragment shader in the vert function, we use this code to assign the color. The lerp value will be a value between 1 and 0 because life is set to 4 by the respawn function, and we multiply this value by 0.25. The red channel will start at 0.1 and increase to 1.1 as life decreases. The green channel starts at 1.1 and decreases over time to 0.1. Blue is always 1 and alpha decreases over time, causing the pixel to fade away. In this example, we showed how useful it can be to use a combination of a compute shader and vertex fragment shader when rendering multiple instances of the same asset. And we used the simplest asset of all, a single pixel color value. In the next example, we'll look at how we can extend this concept to render multiple mesh objects. So we'll continue from here in Compute Shaders Part 2.